Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Phylex. This is your first Phylex. I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful time. Now, today's session is the biomechanics of training injuries. Now, before I get started, just a quick reminder as well that at 9.45 this morning will be the keynote address. So when this is complete, make your way down the stairs and then you'll be good to go. So, hailing from New Zealand, Tim has over 15 years of experience in physiotherapy and fitness. The principal physiotherapist and director of Physio Fitness, he is a rehabilitation expert, a clinical educator, and he's a regular Phylex presenter. Tim specialises in sports, fitness and training injuries, and has a passion for corrective exercise re re oh God, rehabilitation programs, as well as strengthening her low his lower back and lumbar disc injuries, shoulder pain, rotator cuff injuries, knee, patella femoral pain, and ACL reconstruction surgery. So, please welcome Tim. Thanks, Tyson. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Good morning, everyone. Um, today's session, um, we've gonna, it's going to be very, very uh, packed. I've tried to bring it down to fit it into one hour 15, so hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, a few housekeeping things. You'll see a lot of videos on this presentation. Um, actually, I've pulled them off and they're separate, so we'll go back from the presentation to the video so they run really nicely. Um, all these videos, and if you want to follow any of these sort of things, I suggest what you do, is a bit of housekeeping, is go, go to the our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram today, that sort of thing, and follow that because you'll see everything that we post as far as a video format, education, goes on that. Um, so make sure you do that. Um, the other thing, um, we, just another housekeeping thing, we are looking for a physio for my practice. We've got a physio that's leaving. So if you know of anyone that wants to work with me, let me know. Or if you're a physio, come and see me after this session, okay? Um, the other thing is too, is we are running workshops and seminars um, later in the year. So if you are interested in that, please do come up um, and register your interest with me. We've got a form, you can write your email down, that sort of thing. So, First of all, what we're going to cover today, um, this session is about training injuries, but it's about the biomechanics behind that. A lot of people get injured and they think it's due to poor form, they think it's due to too much load, and what they don't understand or are educated about is it's the biomechanics behind that. Like most people will come away from doing an exercise and they go, oh, you know, I've got this really sore shoulder. If it's one side, it's probably not their form. But even if it is their form, say they're doing a bench press and their shoulder is out on one side, why is it out like that? Is it just because they are, they just can't, they're not looking at what their arm is doing and they're out too wide and they're pressing out here and they're getting a sore shoulder and they should be sort of lower down? Or is it because they're weak in that shoulder and they just, because they are weak, they can't keep it in a certain position? So it might not be, yes, it's their form, but almost not their fault because they can't keep the form because they have got a weaker shoulder. And why is it weak? Is it because they're left-handed and they're a right-hander? So there's a lot of things that are involved, and what you'll see as we go through this that there's factors that are external and internal. And I'll, go th I'll explain what I mean by internal and external um, that predispose these people to injuries. There's, obviously, we're going to look at all the biomechanics, of course, so get you to understand the guts of what we're talking about. Then we'll examine some training movements. So we'll look at, there's five sort of disciplines, if, I, if you like. I'm going through pressing, overhead lifting, squatting, deadlifting, and on single leg. And a lot of the things we'll talk about today are very now. So Olympic lifting, CrossFit, all those type of disciplines that um, involve a lot of heavy load and need really, really good form. And we'll talk about why people might be getting injured in these disciplines, not due to, oh, it's bad, or anything. all these things like CrossFit and Olympic lifting are amazing disciplines and amazing exercise, and when they're done well, they're awesome. But people are still getting injured, and we need to know why. Um, and we'll look at incorrect versus correct normal movements, working out combinations of, you know, there might be one thing that's going wrong, but they might have three of these things going wrong. And then that's where you've got to get your head around, okay, how am I going to work out? What's, is it their shoulder form? Is it the load? Is it because they have an old injury? Is it because they're stiff? Is it because they're weak in that side? Are they right-handed? 
you know, have they got a biomechanical fault in their spine? And, and putting all those things together and working out, okay, well, what do we need to do to try and prevent this person from getting injured? So that's in a nutshell what we're going to cover today. Um, let's start off straight into it. What I'd like to talk about is internal versus external. Now, just to remind you, these slides have changed. So if you've downloaded this handout, I've changed it. So <laughs> we'll, if you register your interest um, today, I will Dropbox you or email you the slides again. Um, internal. So when you think about someone who's got a biomechanical problem or biomechanical fault and they're getting injured, the internal part is things like what is happening inside a joint. Okay, Is that joint sitting perfectly in the socket, say when they squat or when they bench stuffs the hip, when they squat or when they deadlift, is it sitting absolutely perfectly and riding perfectly under load? All right, so it's an internal problem. And you can't see that. All you're looking at is their form. Are they, you know, are they squatting correctly? Have they got their knees out over, you know, externally rotated in their hips? Are they doing things right? But what you can't see is what's happening inside the joint. Um, there's also the structure and stability of that joint. All right, so sometimes people uh, have different type of joints than other people. They might have biomechanical changes in the joint. If they're older, that joint might have changed through time, wear and tear, they might have less cartilage. If they've got a congenital defect in that joint, they might have an acromion that is a different shape. There's three types of shapes of acromion. And so these are the things you've got to understand that they lead to biomechanical problems. Um, and the instability of a joint. So has that person had dislocation in that shoulder when they were 15, they're now 30, and they've got a bit of a loose shoulder, so when they do a press overhead, that ball might not be sitting absolutely perfectly because it's a, it's a loose, it's an unstable joint. Okay, So those are your internal things. Then you're talking about muscle and tendon strength. So if you're doing a push-up and you've got a weak rotator cuff on one side because you're a right-hander and you've thrown a ball for your entire life on your right hand, you're really strong here, you've got a bit of a weakness in one part of that shoulder, that's more of an internal thing. Okay, So they might have a ex weak external rotator cuff, so when they press, they internally rotate and start causing stresses in the shoulder joint. So that's an internal thing. Um, tendon strength. So if you've done a lot of exercise over your life and you've got a little bit of a tendonopathy in one tendon, so there's, there's a weakness sitting in the joint. Um, and then motor control. So your actual internal coordination from brain through muscle, right, being the ability to, when you press or press overhead or when you snatch or when you squat, and it's a classic thing if you've seen someone who has not done much exercise in their life or they've not done, um, they've done a small amount of training or a long amount of training, um, they're not quite good, their form's not quite good, they're not very coordinated. Um, there's that aspect, but there's also an aspect of coordination of an individual joint. So lots of things to think about. The external things are the easier things to think about. Okay, form and technique, you know, so you can visualize and go, okay, no, no, your knee's rolling and bring it out. Okay, so those things you can change. But what I'm going to, we'll find today is why is that knee rolling in? And a lot of time, I, what I see in my clinic is, especially with people um, that are getting trained, is they will try and correct the form and thinking that's going to fix it. So, oh, yeah, your knee's rolling and you've got to stop that. But they're not addressing why that is happening. They don't have the skills or the ability to work out, well, what are all the factors that are involved in that hip that's letting that knee roll in? Or is it because their foot is pronating? Is it because they're weak in their external rotators in their hip and they're rolling in? Is it because they're a left footer and they're stronger on that leg and that's just an uncoordinated side that just rolls in, a natural just movement? Is it because they have a little back injury? Is they tighten the hip flexors? And there's lots of things going on. It gets a wee bit sort of, oh my God, you know, how am I going to, can I just, just push your knee out, you know, and you'll be fine. Um, but if that, and this is why people get injured, because if it's not addressed about actually why it's happening, and then fixing that one component, then they'll still break down no matter how much form, especially when load goes on. Um, so that's really, really important, posture, form, and pants. But you guys know that. You know, you know that you've got to keep good form. And, and lately, what I've seen over all the disciplines, especially in the gym, is that you know, form is getting better and, and people getting really focused on their form and, and control and how important it is, especially under load. And the trainers that work in, um, in the gym I work at in Bono Junction, 
um, in fitness first. You know, these trainers, they're amazing. And they, at the moment, the fad is trying to, you know, snatch and do handstands and all sorts of stuff. And all that's great, but they spend a lot of time on it. And you'll see them training in the gym when they're not training clients all together, working on, you know, really strict form and, and working on how hard it is to, to get to that ability because well, there's a little bit of competition in there, but... Um, they want it, They know un, and understand how important, especially with me running around, you know, looking at them, um, because when you do a very difficult move like that and you put them under load, if you don't have your form right, yes, you're going to get injured. Um, external other things is load, speed, and task difficulty. So there's a big difference with doing a nice, slow, graduated deadlift than doing a clean or a snatch off the floor. Okay, it, it, there's a big difference there, and. You know, to try and do very difficult tasks with, you know, bad form is well, not bad form, but with form that is not up to speed will lead to injuries because you're just putting joints through incorrect movement patterns. And then classic stuff: conditioning, programming rest. So people are getting injured because they're doing exercises that they they don't know that they're not conditioned for. Okay, or they're doing too much too soon. They're packing way too much in into a session and they're not doing enough rest. So I think you'll find the external things are pretty much, yeah, yeah, I understand that. I've got it, you know, I can work on that and really, you know, take that out of the equation. The internal things is what you guys have got to be aware of and be educated in to understand, okay, what else is going on. And sometimes that does mean a referral out to, say, a physio or someone who can specialise in working out what the problem is. Is it there? You know, hip joint, is it, do they need a scan? Is there something going wrong with their knee? You know, have they got a lot of wear and tear in there? That It's not just the fact that they're, they've got bad form. It's not the fact that they've got load. It's not the rest. It's not the program. It's not the difficulty. It's biomechanically they've got something going wrong with that knee. Then you need to address it, and what are you going to do about it? So bear that in mind. This is the nuts and bolts of it. I've put this down to eight things that you guys need to think about when you're training. Okay, Eight factors that need to be taken into account when you are training to prevent injuries when you load these people up. First thing, joint instability. So think of functional instability is where, let's take the shoulder joint, is rolling around the socket because you don't have a good enough rotator cuff, say, at posterior, external rotator cuff. So when you press forward or press push up, that sort of thing, the ball's not sitting absolutely perfectly because the muscle control is a little bit different from it. It's not perfect. Okay? It's a functional instability. So say if I press upwards, if I don't, my ball in my socket, if it does not get held well and it hits the roof of the shoulder too early, okay, that's when you can start running into problems or if it comes forward too much. Um, and there's joint or capsule instability, say when someone is hypermobile or they've had a previous dislocation, that sort of thing. Or they've got wear and tear. You can get joint instability from wear and tear. Okay? So that's a, and that's a, that's a hard one, but it's a very important one to take into account, especially when pressing overhead. Um, previous injuries. So this is where, again, you guys need to be asking your clients have you had a previous injury? And then going, okay, what does that mean to that client? What do I need to take into account when I'm training them, when I start <coughs> loading up? Because a lot of these people won't have pain until you load them enough, and you just don't know, but you need to take into account. So every time you reprogram them and give them a new program or you start increasing the load and they get excited, okay, oh, yeah, I want to do this, let's go for this this week, you've got to keep that bearing in mind. You know, what about that previous disc injury? You know, and people say with disc injuries, the disc injury doesn't go away. It's managed. You know, so sometimes, yeah, I've had a disc injury you know, a, couple, you know, a few years ago, but it's absolutely fine. So, well, it's fine at the moment because we're not squatting 100 kilos yet. But when we get to that, it may not be fine. And you've got to work out, you know, what am I going to do with that person? Um, muscle atrophy. So people who have just got general deconditioning, they might have had, it's funny, I'll get people in the clinic who've come in with knee pain from squatting and they look at their form, it's all okay, and the trainer's going, well, what's going wrong with this person? They're getting knee pain. I said, well, their VMOs are wasted, can't you see that? And they go, oh, I don't even notice that. Yeah, oh, yeah, it is a bit, yeah, it's a bit skinny, this leg. And they go, oh, yeah, no, I heard it a few years ago, and yeah, okay, right, though. 
what's not right, you know. But they don't, they're asymptomatic until they start loading or they run enough or they do enough squatting, that sort of thing. And this is where this person's kept their form right, they've worked on their glutes, everything, but they just have missed something. Um, so you can, you can see that, and if, and if you look at muscle atrophy, you've got to work out why, especially if it's on one side. And muscle weakness can be if they've been right-handed. You've seen a lot of people who are strong in one calf. You know, they've got a, they've got a bigger calf than the other side. What does that mean biomechanically when that person runs? They might not get a calf tear on that side, but something else is going to have to give, okay? It's not, the joint on that side, the knee joint is not as supported as the other side. You know, are they working hard in their hamstring? And you've probably all discovered that when you stretch, you're different left than right. You know, you stretch your groin out, you've always got a bit of a tight groin. If you've got a tight groin here, you might have a bit of a tight, well, why is that's tight, but then this buttock's tight, and then that side of my lower back's tight. And, you know, there's changes where people, you've, you've been compensating. So very important to take into account. Um, you will then get patterning changes. So if something's weak, the body is quite clever and dumb at the same time. It'll be clever in, a, in the fact that it'll go, oh, that's weak, I'll just compensate, and I'll do this to try and make up for that. It doesn't just go and strengthen that area up and go, oh, okay, that's a weak calf, I'll just build that up to balance that person. It compensates. So we're very good at compensating. Unfortunately, what happens is we go into a bit of a pattern with that. So, you know, if someone's squatting, they'll compensate and they'll tend to drift off to one side because they like loading that side because the side's weak. Okay, and you consciously have to go, no, I need to stay neutral, okay? And sometimes when they do that, if it's weak on the side, they're going to overload that side and you're going, what am I, how's this going to work? So then the physio will come and say, well, you've got to strengthen one side. You know, you can't just correct the form and hope that one side's going to strengthen up. You'll probably just overload that side because you're trying to do something that the left side can do. Um, mobility, now, the big topic at the moment, right? Mobility. Anyone's using this word mobility? And it's great because physios, we mobilize things, so we're, we're loving this. You know, everyone's working on mobility. Um, what you've got to realize is there's mobility, which is things like making joints more flexible, if you like, so mobilizing joints, using distraction bands like this sort of thing. Okay, using bands, hooking around your hip when you're doing hip flexor stretches, external rotation stretches, pigeon stretches, that sort of thing. Okay, a lot of the stuff that Kelly starts using, some fantastic stuff. Okay, mobility of joints and mobility of soft tissues, like using a trigger point ball, that sort of thing. Then there's flexibility, I'm stretching of muscles. All right, but also what you've got to think about is hypermobility, so a natural, generalized movement that's outside the general norm, okay, so someone who's got lots of mobility in the joint, lots of range in that joint, what does that mean to that person? That means that person needs more muscle control relative to how loose that joint is. So someone who's got a very stiff joint doesn't need as much muscle control to keep that joint stable because it's stiff. They need a lot of stretching because if they start running out of ranges, they're going to start getting injured. Whereas the hypermobile person who's got lots of range, therefore needs more muscle control over that range. And if they don't have it, they start running into problems. So when you think about mobility, think there's, there's a few things going on there with mobility. And not everyone needs to be doing lots of mobility because they might be hypermobile. Okay? Um, poor alignment across multiple joints. So when you think of that, think of those people, you've probably all seen the old Q angle person, okay, where they have pronated feet, they've got a valgus knee, wide hips, okay, extended back. So there's multiple joints where they have angle problems. And it's, you just can't just correct that with, oh, just you know, correct your form. There might be some biomechanical actual shape changes through those limbs. Not everyone is absolutely exactly the same. So the way they hold themselves, that's got to be taken into account because if you squat with someone who does this, you know, you just keep your knees out, and they can't, you know, you may find you have to address, okay, well, why can't they? You know, is it because they've got really, really tight hips that have been tight for 20 years, and you've got to try and work out how am I going to get that hip looser? Is it going to take 12 months of stretching? You know, you can't just, oh, just keep your knees out, you know. Are they going to compensate when you try and do that and then start stressing other structures because if they've actually got a biomechanical problem here and they try and push out, are they going to start injuring other structures? Um, 
Dominant side, coordinated side, stronger side. Really important when you're squatting, when you're pressing, when you're lifting overhead. You've got to remember, as humans, we have one side stronger than the other. There was a small population that is very ambidextrous, and they say, oh, mate, I'm pretty even left and right. And it's hard to sort of work out sometimes because you know, oh, yeah, I know I'm right-handed, but you look the same. And when we're doing training thing, things that involve training with two hands, you know, we do the same on each side, okay? But if someone is more coordinated on that side, you may find that side takes over a little bit. Or the uncoordinated side, especially if we're doing a very coordinated movement, if they're doing something overhead, okay, up to here, and they're going, yep, my right side can do it, so that's so, so it's it's one arm, you know, or kettlebell, something like that, one arm can do it, okay, they're doing this sort of work, one arm can do it, that's great. It's working well on that joint because you're very coordinated. You've got your brain has just worked out those pathways over years and years and years of how to move that joint well, and then you're expecting the other side to do this exactly the same thing. And at some point, it's going to break down because if it's not riding correctly, it's not absolutely perfect. Then it just takes a little bit of time, and then that tissue starts breaking down. Um, and then, just simple. Inability to just stabilize. So people who you put them into a squat, they just can't get it. You know, they just they sort of just they just don't know what they're doing. Especially the people who are new to training, they just not they can't stabilize their spine or they don't know how to you know get their core switched on. They they, they struggle a little bit, and that's a biomechanical problem that you need to address and need to take into account. So all these things is oh, a bit overwhelming. And go, oh, crikey, can we just you know get their form right and everything will be great? But no, you've got to work on these eight things and make sure that every one of those things is addressed when in your program for that client. So, when you think about injuries, just keep it simple. It's a positional fault, whether due to be one of those eight. Then you load the tissues up, and then they get tissue failure. Pretty simple stuff. So why do these injuries happen? That's why they happen. If you're going to break it down to sort of three things, that's why it happens. Um, and it's, it's not hard. So if someone's getting injured, especially on one side, you've got to think, okay, I'm loading up the tissues. You may say, well, I'm just, hang on a minute, I'm just loading normally. Like they're just doing a normal amount of load as they did last time. Yeah, but where's the positional fault? Okay, you're not going to get injured unless you slip over in the sports field and roll your ankle. That's different. That's a sports injury. This is training injuries. Okay, you're not going to get injured unless one of those things is happening. Positional fault or mechanical overload. Okay? So some people just do massive overload and they get sore on both sides, but it's usually when it's one side. Most people come in, 99% of the time, people come into my clinic one-sided injury or a back injury, of course. Um, but it's usually one-sided. It's not like, oh, I've gone and injured this exactly the same thing on both sides. It just don't, I don't see that. Okay? And sometimes people come in and they have some really sore on both sides. It's just DOMS or severe DOMS. So they've done the mechanical overload part, but biomechanically they've been okay. They've just loaded the heck out of themselves. Okay? And you can injure tissues that way. The most training injuries are a result of positional fault and mechanical overload. All right, so let's get into it. There's five things I'm going to go through. I've broken them down. The first one is forward and overhead lift. So what I mean is either pressing overhead, lifting forward, that sort of thing, where that shoulder joint is moving forward and above the head. Okay, so not a pressing forward movement, moving up and above the head. Um, so examples of those things, you know, snatching, clean, difficult stuff. Um, let's look at this. Just to give you some perspective of what we need to think about. Glenoid centering. So I put this on the top of the list because this is one of the major things why people get rotator cuff problems is the ball in the socket. And you probably, if you've seen me before, you've seen me speak about this before. The ball in the socket does not sit absolutely perfectly in the socket. And we've got to work out why. Is it why? Because they don't have a good rotator cuff? Is it because they're internally rotated? When they're, when they're lift, lifting up and they're doing this sort of thing. You know, haven't they got enough coordination on that side? Is there scapula winging? Okay, so lots of different things that make that happen. The long lever thing is very interesting. Okay, you would have learned levers back in the day. 
So having a long lever, obviously the longer the arm and the more load through here, the, the stronger you need to be in here right, when you lift up, right? and especially when you're pressing overhead. And you know, this position here, when you're shoulder pressing, is not great if you've got a ball that's sitting up a little bit higher in the socket because you might have a, a little bit of a weaker rotator cuff or you're really tight in that back of that rotator cuff. Okay, so this, so you know, being in a more of a front position here is better. Making sure when you're coming up, if you look at me this way, you don't, you know, you don't lose your external rotation and start going into impingement. You, you know, making sure you've got that external rotation position. If you're up in this position here, above your head, making sure you're not in this position. You know, fully external rotated into a nice stable shoulder position. Okay, so. When, when you are pressing up, is that ball moving forward? Is it moving up? You know, is it catching? And you won't see it happening. You can't have x-ray eyes, but it's something you need to take into account. This might be happening because they have a weak rotator cuff. Um, scapular abduction wing. So when you come up into this position, you need those scapular moving into abduction all right, perfectly. If they are not, you'll get too much work rate through the shoulder joint. And these, the human body is designed to work beautifully, okay? And if you have pain in your neck because you've been at the computer for 10, 10 years and you've got a bit of a sore neck, that is gonna affect what is happening with that shoulder blade when you press it above your head, okay? And if you look at that person, the person sitting there with a bit of an elevated shoulder, okay, there's a biomechanical fault there. Are you gonna load that person up and ex not expect them to get injured? You know, so things you've got to take into account. The scapular abduction part, if they've got a bit of a weakness through their scapular stabilizers, maybe it's serratus, maybe it's lower traps, maybe their rhomboids are too active. When they abduct, if they don't abdu abduct enough, they have to make more range, get more range in the shoulder joint. Unfortunately, though, this is my roof of my shoulder, this is my head of my humerus. When I raise my arm up, if I don't get enough abduction, at some point, I'm going to get impingement. I need that opened up fully into there. And you need to understand how much abduction you need in that shoulder. Okay? Um, I'm going to show you a video of a picture on that. This is two examples of scapular winging. So, what's wrong with that picture? I've just given you a clue that's scapular winging. But what does that mean? What do you see? Say that again? Yeah, they're not. Here's my little laser. Here, the whole shoulder, if you imagine, if these are the shoulder blades, the shoulder's sitting like that. Okay, they're not flush against the spine. It's not protracted. Okay, it's sitting in shore. Don't get misconception of protraction versus winging. Okay, the other thing with a winging scapula that has got a lower trap problem is that is sitting on an angle. So it's not not only is it sitting like that, it's sitting like that. So this should be up and down vertical. Yeah, this one's a little bit better, isn't it? This person's left-handed. Can you see what's going on there? Yeah. Now, is it because they're left-handed that they're strong on the left-hand side? Probably. Is that person been carrying a child on their right-hand side for three years? Yeah. Are they on the mouse? Have they got a job that involves doing this? Okay, there's lots of things you've got to think about. Why is this happening? And what is happening? Okay, so if that shoulder's sitting there in a resting position... That is your general tone and strength of that person. When they, therefore, when they, do you think it's going to come beautifully perfect when they go overhead? Okay, no. Okay, I'm weak in my shoulders. Okay, okay, well, what am I going to do? Is, should that woman be pressing overhead? I mean, we need to teach them how to press overhead because it'll get them stronger, but we've got to do lots and lots of components and lots and lots of rehab stuff. And you'll see my lecture this afternoon on what we need to do for this person. Yeah? Okay, how does that sequence work? Do, what do we need to work on first before we even get them doing overhead squats? 
You know, could that person do overhead squats, or are they just going to blow out their upper trap and get neck pain? Yeah. And usually, you combine with this, they're going to have a bit of rotator cuff problems. The next person is that a little bit harder to see, isn't it? Is there a difference between the height of those shoulders? And this person's fit and strong, and they can lift a lot. But can you see that little word tip there? You can just see it. Some people you can't see, and the reason you can't see it is because their rhomboids are so thick and massive. And you can't, she doesn't have much rhomboids, does she? So you can see the board. If that was filled up with muscle tissue, you don't see it. He is a really, really bad winger. But it's just harder to see, isn't it? Until you get your hands in there and feel like, hang on a minute, that whole shoulder blade is sitting on the wrong angle. And he's what we call a functional, this is it's quite funny, this person here, where's my little thing? This person here is, is hypermobile, and they can switch on those muscles and look really good. Like in the right position, they can actually, they've got really good coordination, they can switch it on really well, and they can hide it. This person looks okay here, as soon as he goes in the push-up, it looks terrible. And the, 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 as soon as he goes in the push-up, his, wing, his shoulder goes and just let go completely. Okay? So, and I'll show you what happens in a, in a bench press in a video with this guy here. What happens? But his is sitting this way. It's just filled up a lot of muscle tissue. And I'll explain what happens of, um, in a bench press, what's happening with that as well. This guy, I, had to, I just got this guy in my clinic two days ago. He's a really high level footballer. He's strong, he's athletic, he's fit. He's come in and done 40 kilo shoulder presses. Okay, so 20 on his side. I think, oh, yeah, that's, that's right. He's strong. looks like a fit bloke. And he's gone and tweaked his neck on the right hand side. He's come in and gone, Timbo, help me, help me. You know, I've got a game once that day. I need to sort this out. And when I assessed him, I don't know if you can, guys can see this very well. Can you see he's got a scoliosis here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I said, you've got a scoliosis here. You know, that's probably why it's happening. And it's a thoracic scoliosis. He's also a little bit kyphotic. As well, so he, if he's and the worst thing is kyphotic scoliotic, and this is a congenital defect. This is something that's happened to him when he was young. Okay, his spine's just rotated a little bit. It's done a bit of an S bend there. It's a bit of a bit of kyphosis, and his body's dealt with that and adapts to it. The body's very clever, adapts to it, and that's fine. You see how his right shoulder's all a bit over the shot. Yeah. Now he is winging massively, but I don't know if you can see that. Especially not in that picture. But he is scoliotic. And the other thing, especially, and it's easy when we're physios, we just start asking questions. What other injuries you've had? Oh, yeah, I fractured my clavicle when I was young. And I look at his clavicle. Now, I can see this. Sorry, you won't be able to see lights. His clavicle, it was a commuted fracture in the clavicle, so in little bits. And so it should, the clavicle, when it is shortened, and there's a big bump there. Sometimes you get like a massive big bump. And you see these clavicles, they're perfectly across on one side and then like a whoop on that side. That clavicle is shortened by, you know, half a centimetre. What does that mean by mechanics of that shoulder? That sh his shoulder sits in by half a centimetre. Do you think that's biomechanically sound when he's doing a shoulder press? So he's got an old, old injury. This is we talk about old injuries. Old, old injury here which has biomechanically changed his shoulder. He's got a congenital defect, which is a scolo scoliosis over here. So when he presses overhead, even though he's got a strong right arm, when he overloads it, his shoulder doesn't blow out, but his neck blows out. Because he's just, the body goes, no, I can't handle that. Okay? But this shoulder is winging, and if I can get this picture here, that shoulder is sitting like that. It's not sitting flat. It's sitting way over here. He's just got so much muscle bulk, you can't see it. You've got to get in there and feel it and look what's going on. And this is what I want to sort of show you guys so you understand. Right, okay, so these people, not that you need to get your hands on them, but these people have biomechanical things going on inside which lead to problems. This is a classic training injury. I tweaked my neck doing shoulder press. Nothing to do with how strong his rotator cuff was. You know, but a lot to do with the shoulder, the scapular position. And it's a lot of things we forget about. You know, 
I'll come to bench press in a minute, but you know, having your shoulder blades retracted on a bench press is absolutely correct and perfect when you're under load because you need a very, very stable scapula to press. You can't afford it to sort of go out of position under 100 kilos, right? So that's why they teach, you know, keep your shoulder blades down and back and that's great. We teach you've got to protract your shoulder but not under 100 kilos. Because if you start losing your protraction ability, you start losing your serratus and your shoulder blade wings. And I'll show you what happens in a shoulder blade when it's winging under bench press. So um, don't get me wrong, you need to retract your shoulder blades and keep them retracted under a heavy bench press and just do horizontal flexion with the shoulder joint. Okay? But the benefits are, you know, pair contrast, but there is also the drawback is it's a lot of load on the shoulder and people can get injured in the shoulder joint and sacrifice the shoulder joint for a bench press strength. It's just the way it is. Okay, and you guys got to remember, I'm not, I'm not advocating don't do bench press. I'm saying do bench press. Okay, it's fantastic for power and strength and size, and that's great. And there's a lot of sports that need it, but remember that it's very taxing. And so, you know, some people it'll be taxing more, and you've got to work out how many people. You know, if this person here should they do being shoulder press or bench press until I've got that sorted, and how much of it can I sort? Is there a ceiling limit on his lifting ability before he gets injured? Because he's got a fractured clavicle or short and changed shoulder blade, he's got a spine that's not, is never going to be straight up and down. Okay? How long do I need to spend on that person to get his shoulder blade and compensate in his muscle system to make up for the fact just so he can shoulder press? Okay, so lots of things to think about. Um, pressing. Um, Pressing might mean anything that's doing that, okay? Dips, rings, bench press, push up. Again, long levers, okay? Pressing forward, very important. The rhythm of your scapula when you push is something you've got to think about. And you'll see on some of my videos, you go onto YouTube, you'll see videos of pressing and pulling and that sort of thing. In physio, we break it right back down and we try and get people doing really good scapulohumeral rhythm and getting them, making sure that when they are from this position, they are retracted, okay, and making sure that they stay retracted, they push forward, and then they protract, because it utilizes the serratus anterior. The stronger the serratus anterior goes, the more stable that shoulder blade is. We're built with serratus and rhomboids. They're antagonists of each other, okay? We can't just live in retraction. It's not, it just doesn't work. Okay, we need to live in retraction. We're doing a bench press, but if that's all we do, then we're going to start running into problems. Okay, we need to make sure we are doing both. So in a push-up, they need they can't stay in retraction and do that in a push-up. Right, they've got to go into full protraction, but making sure when they do that, they don't go and go into internal rotation. They need to stay in that nice, stable glenohumeral joint position, that external rotation position. This is where people talk about, especially Kelly Star will talk about breaking the bar, which is perfect. You know, it's just getting that position where they're, they're not externally rotating their hands, but they're thinking about external rotation, so they're creating some torque and some wind-up in that shoulder to keep that shoulder in a great position while they, they press forward. Um, so very important, you've got to think about what am I doing with my shoulder blade when I push and, my, and I pull? Make sure that I am getting great movement because the serratus anterior stops the shoulder blade from winging. All right? We'll come to a video in a minute. Um, if people are doing a lot of back work or a lot of press work without protraction, they're not doing protraction, they keep their shoulders back and down, they're doing a lot of pulling, they're doing a lot more rhomboids than they are serratus in their gym program. You need to be balanced if you want a stable shoulder, otherwise you're going to walk around like this. So you have way active over rhomboids. Now what does that mean? If I've got really overactive rhomboids, they're big thick ones, you see them on people, they have massive rhomboids, and then you can't see them winging because the muscle tissue is making up for the fact you can't see that they're like this. Remember, the rhomboids are the antagonist of serratus. So the stronger the rhomboids get, the harder it is for serratus to combat and that shoulder blade just starts shifting. And then they are winging, so they think, okay, my shoulder is winging, I need to flatten them, so I'll pull them back, which is making it worse. They've actually got to push them forward. 
because that fires serratus, and serratus protracts, but it's the only muscle that is going to get that shoulder blade flat on the spine. All right? um, and yeah, you know, serratus anterior, you're going to have weak lower traps most of the time. You saw that on that woman who was sitting like that. Okay. Um, posterior cuff tightness. So this sort of goes hand in hand. People with tight posterior cuff in the back. Okay, so it might be some for spinades, might be a part of the capsule. Okay, soft tissues. You know, getting in there at the trigger point board is great. All right, and loosening that up. But sometimes they need a bit of treatment on that, and then proper stretches. But also, why is it tight? Is it because it's weak? You know, don't run into the trap of going, oh, I've got a tight rotator cuff because so when I press, it's not my ball's not sitting properly, and you know, so I've got to loosen that up. Why is it tight? Is it because it's weak? And loosening it up is not going to make it strong. So just doing mobility work and getting on trigger point balls and doing stuff is not going to fix one isolated weakness issue. And that needs to be addressed with boring rotator cuff stuff, probably. And that's why physios do that work, is to build up that component of that weakened area so then when you go and bench press, it's sound. And then you work on your form and your technique and whether you're protracting and how much load and all that sort of thing. Um, we talk about internal rotation. All right, so internal rotation is fine. You throw a ball and you know, you'll internally rotate, especially cricketers. That's fine. But when you are under load, when you're doing a discipline like bench press or shoulder press, you need to be in this external rotation position. Okay? So never out here. This is just going to run you into trouble. Right? You need to be, like I like that 45 degree sort of angle. Okay? So down here when you're doing a push-up or a bench press. And when you look at that position, your hands are just wider than your shoulders where they should be. Right? But you get that external rotation position. When you're out here, you're going to be into a little bit more internal rotation. And under load, that can run into trouble. Um, so elbow, elbow position, lack of torque. When we talk about push-ups, and you'll see this in the literature quite a bit, when someone's in a push-up, you know, and you're probably going, yeah, 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 I do that. But you'll see a lot of people still going way out here and doing a push-up. Oh, yeah. Okay, and they last for a while until they start getting a bit of a sore shoulder because they're just internally rotating. So they need to be in this position, but I love that cue where you go, okay, screw your hands into the ground and make your elbows go forward. And, you know, that's a great cue, and you're probably already doing that. But what are you doing it for? You're doing it so you get external rotation torque wound up in the shoulder so those muscles fire up and hold on and keep that ball in the right position when you press. But then you've got to think about what are my shoulder blades doing and, you know, are they protracting well enough and what does that mean if they're not? So, things like push-up sinking is when they go into a push-up, I don't know if you can see me, if they go into a push-up and they start here, that's great, they retract, which is awesome, they should, be, they should be in full retraction at the bottom, which is what you want, because you don't want to be in protraction at the bottom, but then they stay there. And, do this. and they'll go, God, I'm a neck. You know, and that's, yeah, of course, you know, you know, but they're not protracting, they stay in retraction, so it's too hard, too much demand. When they stay in retraction to stabilize, they've lost their serratus. So they go, I need more than just my rhombus. So they use their upper trap, and that winds up to stabilize. All right? And. What happens at the shoulder joint? What is happening with that scapula when it sits in correctly when you load it? All right. So we talked about positive and negative bench press. You know, bench press, and especially in powerlifting, is fantastic. Okay, it's awesome. But a lot of times sport, especially rugby, it's not really required because there's two taxing of the shoulder. They've got enough problems with the shoulder joint in rugby with tackling and all sorts of things. They don't need people doing bench press and potentially injuring themselves because they're loading up the shoulder joint. All right? You just got to remember that. It is a fantastic exercise, but there's a high demand on the shoulder. So let's look at some video. I'm going to show you one of my mates, Mike, who... Here he is. Now, let's just get a bit of mute on this. <laughs> and 
of course it fails. Let's try that again. Okay. So, with Mike here, again, you've got to be in this 45 degree here. He's got a winging scapula. He's the one you saw with the winging scapula. Now, what I'm showing you here is if that shoulder blade, when it's retracted, so when you're retracted on a bench press, if you're winging, no matter how, what, remember, when you retract, it's not going to fix the winging. It's just going to, if it's winging, when you retract, it's just going to do that. It's not going to go, when you retract, it's not going to flatten you. Okay, you think it is, it's not. It's going to sit like this. So even though he's retracting the gut, my form is great, I've got my shoulder blades retracted. If he's winging, it's like being protracted. Okay, it's like having it forward. All right? So if that shoulder blade is like that, when his, if this is the arm bone, when he comes down into a press in here, at some point he's going to run into trouble in the capsule and the joint because he's not getting that, that shoulder is sitting here, it should be here. He's going to run out of room almost. And it's exactly like going way too deep in the shoulder doing that. It's that sort of movement. And this is where people get problems here. They'll come into my clinic and go, I've just been on the bench press and this really hurts. What have I done here? And I'm sore on the back and that sort of thing. Because that shoulder blade has sat forward and they've gone and almost done a, a movement like that. But because they're, they're way back here, but it's sitting forward. Does that make sense biomechanically? And you put 100 kilos on that, and there's your mechanical overload with a positional fault. And that's why they get injured. And there's different structures that get injured. It might be the rotator cuff, might be their bicep, might be the back of the capsule, could be their neck. It just depends on what that person overloads first. Okay? So, in this thing, you know, there's no point trying to protract on a bench press, okay, when it's heavy, because you're just not going to get good enough control at the top. You just, you just can't get that little bit there. Your miles will sit in retraction, okay, and keep it safe enough for the rest of your body. Okay, you just got to make sure that person isn't winging. Okay, and if they are winging, should they be loading up the bench press? And if they do, they're probably going to get injured. All right? This is why physios bang on about winging so much. <laughs> All right? You good with that? All right. So there's lots of things to think about with that shoulder press. Um, now, let me just... Yep, cool. All right, squat. Any type of squat. What are you doing? Air yeah, squat. Box squat onto a box. Back squats, front squats. Sumo squats. Um, I just quoted Kelly there because we're going to talk about butt winking. And I'll video butt winking because I had to get it, I had to video myself to, so I, I was sure that you could see what was going on. It's a loss of the neutral spine at the top of the squat and the bottom of the squat. Physios, we bang on about neutral spine. Okay, you've got to keep neutral spine. You know, you've got to keep good form. But why? Okay? Is it protecting the discs in your lower back? Yes. Okay. So the neutral spine is so important, not just, oh, you've got to keep good form so you don't get injured. You've got to understand you know, what you're trying to protect and what you're trying to achieve. At the top of the squat, they start like that in extension. Okay. Or they're a neutral, and the first thing they do is do that before they've even moved. All right. So they go, right, go and they'll just go straight into extension. And it's their motor pattern, or what they've learned from zero to when they're 25, of how they move. So they move, they go, they stick their bum out. And is that because they're tight in their hips? Is it because they're weak in their core? Is it because they're really strong in their lower back and extensors? And that's the first thing the brain uses, is just pre-motor fires their extensors, and they, when they go launch straight into extension. It's their tight hip flexors, just as soon as they move, the body goes, Okay, where am I going to move the most? Oh, their lower back's hypermobile, but they've got really tight hip flexors, so they'll just do that. Because there's heaps of things to think about of why that person is doing that, not just like, hey, just stop doing that. You know? Just, just hold your form. They go, I, I, I can't, because my brain is so wound up. It's like trying to teach someone how to change their golf swing. How long is that going to take? A year? With a pro? Or, you know, you're throwing your right hand, and you're, you know, watch this, I'm a left-hander. So I throw a ball at this. 
My left hand. This is my right. Does that look... A... That's me trying... Hang on. That's me trying as good as I can. This looks funny, right? Yet I'm shoulder pressing and bench pressing. And I've got different... Massive different motor control issues going on there. So when someone goes into a squat, okay, it might be they've got lots of, you know, really built up motor control, not problems, but differences that are not ideal that make them do that. Okay, so you've got to take that into account. But the, it's the winking there. Now, when you go an extension here, you're not going to, you're going to get to some point where you're going to roll into flexion. And that's the wink there. Now, that is absolutely fine. And I watch my little three-year-old son go into you know, full flexion here. And he's doing stuff that like, oh, I can't even do it because they're so mobile. Right? They're right down here and they're playing with their toys and they're in full flexion. And that's normal. They're a baby. He doesn't have his body weight on his back. All right? So if you've got 100 kilos, you're only a person, and you've got it on your back, you cannot go into flexion at the bottom of a squat. Or you'll run into risk of injuring something. And whether that's injury, injuring your hip, whether it's injuring your disc, you're going to injure something most likely over time. It might not be then, it might be in a year, it might be when you've got enough wear and tear in your discs and they just can't handle it and they fail, it might be 10 years' time. Okay? But it could be your client, it could be tomorrow. That's what you've got to think about. So, loss of neutral spine, very important, I'll show you a video of that. Um, basically, when they go into flexion, their discs go from being nice and neutral to posterior, not bulge, but the, the pressure load will go posterior. Okay, you do that enough times under load, that can fail. We've had people come in from disc injuries, they win that happened, oh, but I was down here and, and I got the and I, and I felt it then. Okay, is it because they, well, we don't know because we didn't video them, but did they lose neutral at that point? Had they been breath holding and they've got no pelvic floor and they've just been bracing and going, Hup! And then they took, a, they took a breath in at the bottom and lost all core control. Okay. Things like that you've got to think about. Um, remember, an upright spine has got less tissue load. So, and this is where people say, oh, keep an upright spine when you're squatting. You know, keep an upright spine. Don't come and do this. But why is that? Because there's less tissue load through the spine. If the spine is more vertical, the vertical load through the disc is more sound. Okay, the more forward you go, the harder it is for that lower lumbar disc region. So therefore, that's why deadlifts are more taxing on the spine than squats are. Don't get me wrong, we need to get people squatting to increase spinal strength. You need to load the spine if you want to strengthen it up, but you can't have biomechanical faults going on. You can't have form technique problems going on. Um, when they squat, have they got a fixed thoracic kyphosis like that guy we saw before? Have they got a, oh, he's got a bit of a round back, he's really tight. So how you expect, when he squats, how's he going to keep a really good neutral spine as he goes down? He's going to compensate something. It's going to be really hard for him to do. He has to have a, if he's got a thoracic kyphosis, I've got one. And a lot of the time they go, well, what, what, how do they get that? You know, is it because they're stiff now or they work at a computer? No, it's because they had a little bit of tiny bit of Sherman's disease when they were 16. And they've got a fixed thoracic kyphosis and they have to try and make up for it. All right? So sometimes you see people like this and they can't get back here. They can't get the shoulder range. If they're lucky, they've got heaps of, you know, they've really worked on their shoulder range and they can get it back there. Okay, good, now I can get the bar on my back. All right? But when they come down here, if they've got a thoracic kyphosis here, you're going to have to make up for it. And then usually what they do is go, bang. Okay, so they've got a round here, they have to do that. I can't, you know, keeping a neutral spine doesn't make up for the thoracic, because that's where you're going, okay, he's going into extension because of his thoracic. Do I choose a different exercise? Maybe I'll choose, maybe I'll get him flexible enough to get into here and do front squats, because it's just way better for him, he's just, because he can't get back here. Okay? Um, it's a big thing you need to take into account. It's not just about getting on the foam roller and extending and thinking it's going to be better, Okay? You do need to do that, but you need to work on other things as well. And remember, with thoracic kyphosis, if he's doing a lot of this, he's going to be weaker through here. He's probably going to be tighter in his hips. There's a lot of things to think about. Pelvic shift and drop. So this is where you see people just going bang. <coughs> you know, and you don't see it, or they don't see it. Oh, it's a little bit. 
And even it's just a little bit or a little bit of a shift under load can go over time can cause problems. Why are they shifting left and right? Is it because when they do the hip flexor stretching, they, you know, they go, God, that's tight. This side is like really mobile. Yeah, maybe they've been a maybe they're a soccer player and they're a kicker and they've got heaps of range here. This one they never kick with. And they, oh, it's tight. So when they go into a squat, they run out of range, and they'll they'll shift. And you think, no, no, don't do that. But you're not working on what is causing that. Yep. Yeah. Um, bad angles. That's just classic, you know. You know, squatting knees forward, bum back, that sort of thing. Um, this whole, there's a lot of talk about where should your feet be when you squat, okay? I remember a few years ago, I was like, no, you've got to keep parallel. You know, this is, this is the best, you know, dig deep squats like that. Parallel is going to get the most amount of strength because it's, you know, it's difficult. Most people run out of range in their hip when they do that. They're just going to get to the point where you're going to need more range, and they're going to make up for it somewhere. They have to lean forward. Okay, or if they have to shove their knees forward. So, you know, people say, oh, no, you know, you've got to be squatting because that's the way you're walking. Okay? If you want to get deeper, you've got to get your legs wider because you need the range, you need to get down, you need to get your pelvis down here. And therefore, if you're doing that, you can't have this knee doing this because it's tight here or you're weak here. Yeah? It's not just a matter about doing that, because under load, if you're weak, it's still going to do that. Okay, and I've got a very good video of one of the trainers who's doing a sumo squat, and he's really strong. Yet he still needs a lot more strength to do a certain movement. I'll show you that in a minute. But that's really important. Now, is that because one foot's pronating? Because they come in, might not be a weak hip, might be a foot pronation issue. All right. So keeping those feet wide is important, but they've got to make sure their knees are wider. So that external rotation here is important. Okay, when you squat, so they need to be external rotating and creating some torque, like screwing your feet into the ground. That's an awesome tip. Okay, but when they squat down, they've got to keep it there, and they need the strength to do it. So you might be working on some glute work to be able to do that, not just correcting their form all the time. That comes down to that lack of hip mobility. So important, especially for back problems. So, so important. Getting in there and getting, making sure, can they get into these positions? And they go, oh, God, that's tight. And working on, and this side, oh, that's worse. Oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. You know, getting, working on the hip mobility, because if you don't have hip mobility, you're, not, you're gonna run into problems when you squat. Um, and lazy glutes, you might have one left and right. An old knee injury. Knee's fine. Their glute is sitting at 90%. When is that going to give them problems when they squat? How much load is it going to take? How many repetitions is it going to take before that person breaks down? Here, we are, here I am. This is just showing you butt winking. Okay, just so you... Let's just pause, Mike, here. So rounding there, and then extending at the top. There's the round. See that little, see that dip through there as I come up? Obviously, I'm over-exaggerating it, right? So down, round, and then I lean forward too much, right? Just explain that butt winking for you. Let's look at deadlifts. You all love deadlifts. Deadlifts are awesome. So when I mean by deadlift, normal deadlift from the floor, hamstring or remaining deadlift, so just working to here, and then sumo deadlifts. Okay. Now sumo deadlifts, we've got a really interesting video about sumo deadlifts and really bad form of there from what I see, just so I, you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Basically the problems are the same as the squat. So you take all those squat problems and fix those to deadlift as well. Plus, what you've got to remember, when you deadlift, you've got an increased forward carrying load. So it is harder. Okay? There's less load on the spine vertically, but there's more shear load this way. Because my weight is forward now over here. My bum is back. Okay, so there's more load going on here. 
All right. Okay, and I don't have to do this movement. This is a lot more complex than, than sort of this movement. Okay, and you can always deadlift more than you can squat. Now, if you're deadlifting more than you're squatting, what is that doing to your back? Okay, yes, there's less actual load, but there's more shear load, so there's pros and cons with it all. Um, you cannot, therefore, let that spine roll into flexion because of that dispressure increased load. You might be start damaging or overloading muscle tissue. Um, your posterior chain flexibility has got a big, is a big factor and a role to play on that. If you're not loose enough through here, through not just your hamstrings, neural tissue, soft tissue, capsula in the hip, okay, all the capsule joints in your spine. If you're a hyperlordotic person, they're not going to have much range this way. Okay, so when they go in extension, are they just going to roll into here? And they don't have enough flexibility to stay in neutral. So you're talking about people like, oh, you don't want to go into the flexion. Yeah, but you also don't want to go into mass amounts of extension. And, you know, people sit there and, they, and they're doing this. You know? And they're working the hamstrings, but their back is just locked up. And that's not great. Um, because when they're in extension, as you will know if you've done any of your internal core work, like TA work, TA works in neutral. Not in extension, not in flexion, doesn't work very well, works in neutral. Um, back extension, the bottom of the lift, those sort of things. Just on sumo, we talked about here where your feet have got to be this way to create torque in your glutes and your hips, right? If they're there, and people are doing this because they're, oh, it gets my glutes more. More glutes, you know, you know stronger, right? But if you've got yourself externally rotated, how are you going to create any more torque if you're already in that position? Okay? All you've got to do from there is go internal rotation. You've got, you've got no more external rotation. So if you're not strong enough, you would immediately go into internal rotation when you go into there. Okay? In this position, when you squat, you've got some power to work with. Okay? You're not moving into external rotation, but you've got some torque there. And I'll show you with this one. This is Aaron, my trainer, showing you how bad. This is him doing, I got him doing a bad deadlift, right, Sumo? Now, see if you can show, tell me, from this point here, looks normal, right? But if I go to the side, Where's his knee sitting? Look at that. Now, would you squat like that? That is technically this. Doing that. But because he's in external rotation, he's got a bit of power, but he's still rolling his knees in. There. See that hip compared to the knee, that straight line down? He's doing that. And this is where sumos, geez, you've got to have a good strength here to hold that knee out and you've got to have some really good range in that hip to get that out over there under load effectively. And he's got good flexibility and he's got good strength and he's got awesome technique. Now that's just doing it poorly. I still got him to do it as good as he possibly could. This is as good as he possibly could. You'll hate me for this. Now, when I go around the side, take a look. He's not bad, but he's certainly not over his toe, is he? He's not externally rotated out here. He's not. He's, if anything, just a little bit in still, and that's at his best. Yep. Where's he training from? He's just showing me. Yeah, yeah. He's, I'm using him as a model. Now, deadlifts, this is what we see. This is, not, this is him doing it poorly to give you guys an idea of what's happening. What's going wrong with this one? Sorry, I'll just stop the others. And I'll just, this might help my mouth. Gosh, stop all this. There we go. Stop. Okay. 
What happened then when he lifted up? Do you guys know you're deadless? Bang, what happened then? There's fine, there's not. What did he do then? He's doing a normal deadlift, and this is what I see all the time. He's showing us what people do. He's coming down into a normal deadlift, okay, into here. He's then doing that, and then doing a Romanian deadlift from the floor, and then up an extension. He's not coming up and then coming. And it's really hard to see when people do it really quickly. So you mentioned the spinal load there. He's going, that's like doing a hamst- a Romanian deadlift all the way to the floor and expecting your spine to be okay and keeping neutral. And if you don't have enough flexibility, of course you're going to be rounded, right? And this is what people do. They come from here and they haven't got their technique right and they go bang into that position there. Or maybe they haven't got enough strong enough quads to that position or enough range in their knees. Okay? A very important thing to do. If you can video your clients and show them down, Slow them down, I should say. Now, if you look at this one, what's wrong with this one? And I know this is a bit about form, but we're going to need to talk about the biomechanics of this. What's happening here? I mean, that's bad, right? That was bad. I know, yeah, yeah, got it, right? Now, what you've got to understand is when he goes into flexion, what is he there for the body's going to do? Do you think he's going to come up to perfect neutral? He's going to then go way back into hyperextension. So what he's doing is lumbar flexion and lumbar extension. So lumbar flexion there and lumbar extension there. Is he really doing any hamstring or glute work? Look at his hips. They're hardly moving. He's hardly doing any hip hinging. He's basically, you see his hips are just not... Hardly moving, right? They're staying in the tunnel like that. So really important stuff. Um, okay, single leg. Oh, you've seen this before? Sorry, I'll bring this up on a big screen. Seen that before? Oh. <laughs> Everyone seen that? No? Old, old, old picture. Really, really good thing. And we, I bring it up all the time. Okay. When you're lying down your back, 25 kilos per body weight of disc pressure. When you lie on your side, 75, standing's 100. Okay? 100%. Call it 100% if you like, disc pressure. When I go forward, I increase that to 150. Just doing that without load, my disc pressure increases to 50% more. Yep. So this is a movement here. When I've got load, it goes through the roof. The worst position in the world is bent forward flies sitting down. Yeah? We don't do those anymore, do we? Yeah? So when you're thinking about a deadlift, this is what we're talking about. So when you're squatting, we haven't got a squatting picture, but when you go forward, the disc pressure increases, and that's something you should be all across. Um... Okay, last thing, single leg. Let's work on that. This stuff, taking into account everything we've talked about as far as what your core should be doing, hip mobility, you know, form technique, what's tight, what's weak. And then add in, okay, now do that on one leg. Okay? Now, this might seem simple, but people who are doing step-ups, okay, single leg squat, that sort of thing, it's going to get a lot harder because there's a lot more motor control issues going on. Most of the time we see people coming in with knee pain from doing single leg work. Not really hip pain, it's more knee pain. But when they're running, they might come with hip pain, which is a single leg work. Running, okay. If they're running with a weak glute, and they do that for 10,000 steps, this is where that biomechanical positional fault mechanical overload gives them the problem. Um, the big one is internal rotation of the knee. So when they stand there, again, you're going, okay, I need my knee tracking correctly. We always talk about knee tracking. Remember, knee tracking like this is not to do with the VMO. It's here and foot. All right? Not just the VMO. The VMO does the patella. Um, 
Is that because they've got lazy glutes on one side, lack of torque, do you need to work on that sort of stuff? Are they dropping down on one side? The big thing about ACL injuries is they happen in sport when people say sidestep, they do that. And if you slow that down, they went bang, dropped their pelvis and internally irritated their knee. Okay, so if they've got a point where they go like that, under load, mechanical fault, bang, the ACL goes. All right? um, other people do it because, say, in the footy field, and I know this is not training injuries for footy field, because they put their foot in the ground and their sprigs get caught. Instead of rotating like this, they, they can't move, and so they do that. They can't maintain alignment. All right, let's have a look at the video then for the last one. So this is one of my patients who has an ACL recon. See his left leg? See the size of his right leg? That is muscle atrophy after four weeks post-surgery. <laughs> Pretty crazy, huh? Now, what I'm going to get him to do is we're just talking about external rotation, right? But when he stands on one leg, what's happening is he can't maintain, his glute's gone, okay, just through the surgery. His glute's gone here, so he has to compensate to stand on one leg. Now, of course, this is post, I'm not going to get him doing box step-ups, am I, four weeks post-surgery ACL anyway, but I wouldn't get him doing it when he's like that. All right? But if this person has an ACL injury a year ago and they haven't fixed that glute, and when they step up, they do that, okay, there's still that biomechanical fault there. All right? So, and it's going to take him a year to get his knee right. Things to think about. What is the pelvis doing when you do a when you do a box step up? So, this is me showing you. Not that I have bad form. This is me showing you what I mean. When I stand up, I don't want to see anyone's pelvis drop when they do a box, well, a bench step up like that. Do you see that dropping down like that? Because what's the biomechanical fault? Well, when you drop here, you might not get a problem here, but you cannot maintain correct knee alignment when you've dropped your pelvis like that. Okay, it'll internally rotate. So when they step up, you'll get that knee internal rotation coming out of alignment. Problems here. Okay, problems there. All right? So watch that. And so you're going to try and correct their form. Okay, keep your pelvis level. They can't keep it level. Why is that? Is it their glute? Is they tight? Have they got lost their mobility in their hip? All right? Are they weak in their knee? Is it their motor pattern? All right? Are they right are they left foot and they're doing a right foot to step up? Lots of things to think about. Okay? All right, I hope that makes sense. Is there any questions on that before you go for the break? Do you want me to answer anything on there? You all good? All right. If you guys, like I said, follow us on all that YouTube and the Facebook and Instagram to get all this content. But also, if you guys are interested in more workshops, that sort of thing, come up and write your email down. I've got a piece of paper for you. Um, and we can go from there. Thanks.